Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? All right, here we go. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We are in the middle, and actually, sorry, not the middle, but we are at the end of Jesus and Pharisees part one. Um, the Pharisees have interacted with Jesus now over the forgiveness of sins with the paralytic, over um, fasting, and this one's going to be over the Sabbath. That's the big one here. So uh, let's take a look. The first thing we've got in our initial context is one Sabbath, Jesus is going through the grain fields. It's just walking through grain, grain fields. His disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them together in their hands, and eat the kernels. So you guys can kind of understand what's going on here. This was a completely okay thing to do. As you go through a grain field, to just pick some up and eat it was not considered theft. In fact, this um, was protected in Jewish law, in, uh, in, the, in the Bible, not just Jewish law, but in, in Scripture. And what they are doing is picking some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the kernels. Picking the, the, the uh, Pharisees would call picking this, would call that harvesting, which would fall under the category of work, which is prohibited on the Sabbath. Rubbing them in their hands, or sorry, picking the heads of grain um, would also include uh, threshing. That's when you separate the seed from the stalk. Rubbing in your hands would be the winnowing. And there's a debate whether this last one would be counting as preparing food. Um, at minimum, the Pharisees in this situation would see three violations, potentially four, of the command not to work. So if we go to our plot line, this is how it begins. Verse 1. Disciples are eating grain as they walk on the Sabbath. And I'm just going to put in kind of parentheses here, just in the green. I'm just using green. It's just a random color. Uh, Pharisee violation. There's nothing that they're doing here that would really constitute work in the biblical sense of work. They're not actually out, actually threshing any of those things. But they certainly broke the Pharisees' violations, okay? So then we come to verse 2. Some of the Pharisees, I, I, I love that he put some, not all of the Pharisees. Some of the Pharisees took issue with this. And they asked this question. Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And the question that we should be asking as we look at that question is why do they define this as unlawful, right? And um, the way that the Pharisees had dealt with the Sabbath was they created all of these rules to define what and was not work. Like how many steps is it before it's work? How much weight is it before it's work? How much um, food can you do, can you husk before it's work? And the Pharisees looking at this harvesting, threshing, winnowing, um, action of the disciples decide, oh, this is unlawful, right? But they're they're violating the Pharisee definition as opposed to the biblical definition of um, of Sabbath, right? Where the command is to rest. So if we're looking at this, um, verse two, the Pharisees take issue with the disciples with what the disciples are doing. All right. Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? So Jesus asks another question, and um, I'm going to underline this in red, but the main question, oh, sorry, I'm using the wrong color. I should be using yellow. Red is for commands. Uh, Jesus is asking, have you ever, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? 
Um, and the reason I'm going to underline this in yellow is we want to ask what is the purpose of this example, right? Jesus is obviously answering their question. Even though they're not really asking a question, they're really just throwing an accusation. Jesus is going to answer it. And we need to know the purpose of the uh, example so that we can understand the lesson here. So Jesus in verse 3, verse 3, Jesus introduces the David story. Why? To teach the Pharisees. Okay, let's go look at the David story. He entered the house of God. This is what David did. He is, is David. Um, David and he are connected here. David entered the house of God and then taking the consecrated bread. Now, if you go to the book of Leviticus, you'll find out that God had told the Levites, and particularly Aaron and the, the family of the high priest, that the consecrated bread was for them to eat, only for the high priest and his sons to eat. But David, one day, he goes into the house of God. He's on the run from Saul. He takes the consecrated bread and he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And on top of that, not only did David eat it, he also gave some to his companions, right? Okay, so there is the uh, number four, or sorry, verse four, the example of David. And again, we got to go back up to this question. Why, or what rather, what is the purpose of this example? Uh, Jesus is making the point here that David did what was technically unlawful um, and, and yet is without sin right? So David ate what's not for him and yet is without sin. I'm going to just kind of come off to the side here. And I want us to think about something for a second. You have David and you have Saul. Both of them do what is unlawful. Uh-huh. Unlawful. But for Saul, he loses the kingdom. King, whoops, king, dumb. And David um, loses nothing. In fact, later he'll become king, right? So as Saul, Samuel expressly told him not to do any sort of sacrifices until he got there. Saul didn't listen and he loses the kingdom. David is actually on the run from Saul. He is running into the priests, uh, into the temple. He says, I'm hungry Please give us some bread. The the, fairs, the, the sorry the, the priest says we have no bread except for the bread of consecration. David says, "Can I have that?" Right, and the the priest signs off on it, gives it to him. Right, and he loses nothing. Why? Well, I think Saul is directly violating a command of Samuel, so we can understand why that happened. But you know, there's this question of uh, the the law is not meant to hurt. The law is not meant to harm. And so David, as the Lord's anointed one, coming and asking for bread to keep him and his men alive, this is a point where loving your neighbor kind of takes precedence over uh, of that act, okay? And and so we have this, this one example where David is going to go against what is actually God's law, but for the right reasons and in the right way, such that there's no penalty for doing it, meaning that it's permissible, it's, it's lawful, right? So we have this unique example of David, and this is the first half of uh, a two-part, um, basically a comparison, if you will. So the first one is the example of David, and I'm gonna put in here, Lord's anointed, Uh, breaking the law for the right reason without penalty. Okay, now let's look at what Jesus says in verse 5. Then 
Jesus said to them, the Lord is the, the, sorry, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Then we'll put a, then uh, we'll just circle that. Jesus said, then the Lord is the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. If we're kind of understanding here, there's, there's basically a comparison being drawn. First, you have the comparison of David, right? And what Jesus is doing is making a um, lesser to the greater statement. Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So there is a, this is the lesser here. And here is the greater. Jesus is not just the Lord's anointed. He is the Son of Man, right? Going back to Daniel 7. And the Son of Man here, because he's God, is also Lord of the Sabbath, right? So he's just taking titles for God, for the ultimate Messiah, applying them to himself and making points, right? So if David could go and get consecrated bread for him and his friends, how much more then can Jesus, the Son of Man, who is Lord of the Sabbath, take kernels, right, of grain, rub them in their hands, and use them on the harvest? So if we're understanding that, there's one... Jesus is greater than David, right? But there's another point being made here. Remember that what they are saying is unlawful. The Pharisees are saying they know what the law means. They know what's unlawful. When Jesus says the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying too, I have the authority to rightly interpret law. Look, if the disciples were doing something that was sinful, Jesus wouldn't let them do it. He wouldn't bless it. But Jesus is pointing out that the Pharisees don't actually know the law. They don't properly interpret it. So this statement, Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, does double duty. It shows how much greater Jesus is than David, how much more reason he has to do what he's doing. But number two, it also shows that the Pharisees really have no idea what they're talking about and that Jesus is correcting their understanding of Sabbath law. So verses five, you have Jesus is, Jesus is the son of man and Lord of the Sabbath and that this has um, in it two lessons. And I'll just circle that in green. And I want you to remember back here, it was a Pharisee violation. Jesus is correcting that. And he's also declaring his authority over the Sabbath um, as well. So just a, a huge, a huge piece in here. One going back to that and the other going back to David. All right, well, let me use, let me use green again. And the other going back to, to David. So two, two lessons there. And these, these are also going to look forward to what comes next. All right, on another Sabbath, right? So the context is the same, right? We got, we got here, I'll just go uh, pink up here. One Sabbath, right? And we got on another Sabbath. So these two stories start the same way, except for this time, instead of in fields of grain, he's in a synagogue and he was teaching. So uh, we'll, we'll finish this out. And there was a man there with a shriveled hand. Uh, we could assume here that the man's hand is um, immobile, like he can't move it, or that there's some kind of uh, muscular atrophy. So whether it's muscular atrophy or it's immobile, the hand has now shriveled. It's not usable for, such, for a very long time. So on another Sabbath, he goes in the synagogue, he's teaching, and there's a man with a shriveled hand. So we have the setting for the next story. We'll start verse 6. Jesus, Sabbath synagogue shriveled hand okay another ripe moment for the pharisees to be able to say hey jesus is violating the sabbath and again according to their customs not according to god's law here we go the pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse jesus so they watched him closely this is literally like uh, kind of like looking at him from the side of their eye just waiting for him to do something wrong to see if you would heal on the Sabbath. Um, so you guys understand healing is the work of a doctor. So it classifies as work. And so 
The Pharisees believed that nobody should be healed on the Sabbath unless it was life-saving. You know, the real righteous people are going to wait until after the Sabbath to do any sort of healing. That's the way that they see it. Again, this is their law, not God's law. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law, looking, they're looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, watching close to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Just want to make a quick point out that Jesus and Daniel uh, share this share this trait, right? That their enemies can count on them to do the right thing. May the same be said of us. So verse 7, the Pharisees uh, wait for Jesus to heal. And in their minds, this means violate the Sabbath. All right. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up. Stand there in front of everyone. So he got up and stood stood there. Jesus sees, he knows what they were thinking. He sees the trap. And instead of like sidestepping it, he, in, he intends to spring it. He intends to show them what they're doing, right? What they're doing wrong. Get up, stand there in front of everyone. Okay, so we'll go back over here. Verse 8, Jesus springs the trap and he's going to do it in such a way that the pharisees are in increasingly pushed to either surrender and acknowledge who jesus is or just outright reject their messiah and it's god's way of working on us or uh, condemning us in our sin because we even more so resist what we should not be resisting but the man stands up he gets there in front of everyone then Jesus said to them, them being the Pharisees, okay, not to his disciples, I ask you, so now Jesus is going to ask a question, which is uh, lawful on Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? I'm going to go back up. We used yellow, right? So this is the, it's like the David example. Uh, this is the question, right, that... Um, it gets them thinking. It should get them reviewing themselves. Uh, and, the, and the question is this, which is lawful on Sabbath? To do good or do evil? What's great about this is, again, the, the, the Pharisees had made the Sabbath all about not doing certain things, whatever they defined as work. So they had missed the point of the law. The point of Sabbath wasn't not to work. The point of the Sabbath is to rest, is to be with God, is to rest in him and have, have sweet, sweet fellowship with him. And so... Obviously then, good, good should be related to the Sabbath and not evil. This is very clear, right? But if we end up creating a version of God's law that causes us to do evil instead of good on the Sabbath, then we know that we've wrongly interpreted law. So with this question, verse 9, uh, Jesus's question reveals... The intent behind God's law. The Pharisees had tied up heavy burdens for everyone. They had made life difficult. They had, um, they had so added to the law that it became burdensome. And Jesus' question really reminds us that laws are given with intent. And knowing that intent is critical for both interpreting, applying, and, and even obeying the law. So, so Jesus' question is powerful here. And if the if Pharisees have ears to hear, this is going to work out well. If, if they don't have ears to hear, it's not going to work out well. So here we go. He looked around at all of them. You know, he's, he's, look, he's going eye to eye with these guys. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was completely restored. What a beautiful moment. The hand is completely restored. So that means the shriveled went away. If it was, you know, a dystrophy issue or a paralysis issue, no matter what, is his hand is fully functional and it's healthy, right? So just this amazing miracle, right? And like, uh, like above, where he says, you know, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This, if you will, is the teaching moment, right? Jesus, in this moment, does several things. One, one, he shows them 
that doing good on the Sabbath is right, right? So it's another teaching moment. But secondly, he demonstrates that God is actually with him. Because if God was not with him, then God would not let this man's hand be healed. The fact that God is blessing this and healing the man's hand is a big, big deal, right? So this is um, proof times two of, of Jesus and, and who he is, okay? So uh, verse 10, verse 10, Jesus heals and proves, one, he is Lord of Sabbath. And then he also teaches, so this I guess would be two, teaches us the true purpose of Sabbath, right? It's for the blessing of us, right? For the for our walk with the Lord, for, for this goodness, right? And unfortunately, uh, verse 11, the Pharisees reject and hate Jesus. Reject and hate Jesus. They respond in the worst possible way. I want to go back real quick to this point right here, that this Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We see that this first peak of a lesson connects then to this second peak of a lesson. And we can kind of understand there why Luke uh, combines the accounts, right? Because together they tell this really powerful picture. The Pharisees, and I'll just, we already wrote it into the timeline, but I'll just put it in here anyway. But the Pharisees, this is real sad, and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. The word for furious here is like literally a, almost a murderous rage. And they're discussing what they might do to Jesus. And you could think they're just going to a room and they're like, how do we deal with this guy? What are we going to do to him? And somebody in that room says, maybe we should kill him, right? And that just becomes a growing desire in the Pharisee's heart until finally they say, we are, we are going to kill him. It's just a, such a sad moment because Jesus is teaching them what rest is all about, what God's plan for them is, which is for, for them to have a life and for things to be good. And they reject him and they hate him for it. And it's just so sad. So it reminds us, you know, we have to be really careful as well not to become like the Pharisees. Not to get so focused on our ideas of what the law means that we lose the intention of the law. And here with this law regarding rest, regarding Sabbath, we should remember that the point of rest is to be with God and for life to be blessed. Um, not for anything else, right? And so we, we have to just be careful with that. And um, anyway, this is, this is Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, teaching the Pharisees and us about the nature of rest.